I think is one. So I want to read you something, and I want you to think about who wrote this, right? So I'm going to read you some stuff, and some of you probably know already, but uh, I'm going to read you, and you tell me who wrote this. All options, I guess, are on the table. I am deeply grateful for the opportunities America has given me. But the giant American corporations who control our economy don't seem to feel the same way. They certainly don't act like it. Sure, these companies wave the flag, but they have no loyalty or alliance to America. Levi's is an iconic American brand, but the company operates only 2% of its factories here. Dixon something, maker of the famous number two pencil, has moved almost all of its pencil production to Mexico and China. And General Electric recently shut down an industrial engine factory in Wisconsin and shipped jobs to Canada. The list goes on and on. Again, who wrote this? These American companies show only one real loyalty to the short-term interests of their shareholders, a third of whom are foreign investors. If they can close up an American factory and ship jobs overseas to save a nickel, that's exactly what they will do, abandoning loyal American workers and hollowing out American cities along the way. Politicians love to say they care about American jobs. But for decades, those same politicians have cited free market principles and refused to intervene in markets on behalf of American workers. And of course, they ignore those same supposed principles and intervene regularly to protect the interests of multinational corporations and international capital. The result, millions of good jobs lost overseas and a generation of stagnant wages, growing inequality and sluggish economic growth. All right, who wrote it? Now, we've got one vote for Elizabeth Warren. We've got one vote for Ronald Reagan. Uh, let me see if there's anything. Stephen Bannon, Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson did cite this extensively in one of his shows, but he didn't actually write it. Um, I mean, you could, you could imagine Donald Trump saying this, just that it's like a thousand times better written than anything Donald Trump would actually say. Somebody says Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders could have written this, right? Uh, Stephen Bannon, another vote for Stephen Bannon. Stephen Bannon's, you know, got, got two people, right? So we got Stephen Bannon, we got Tucker Carlson. Uh, I say it could have been, it could have been uh, you know, this, this happens on a number of themes that um, Trump is talking about, the hollowing out of our cities uh, and uh, jobs leaving, and how dare a third of uh, shareholders are foreigners and they're making the money. FDR, we got two votes for Elizabeth Warren. Um, Ronald Reagan, somebody says. Oh my God, no. You don't know Reagan if you think he wrote this. No way this is Ronald Reagan. As much as I don't like Ronald Reagan on many issues, this is not Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was like a million times better than this. All right, this was written by Elizabeth Warren. And this is a part of Elizabeth Warren's uh, new, one of her plans, right? Elizabeth Warren, you have to give her credit. Elizabeth Warren is the only politician I know, the only politician I know, who has taken the time and made the effort to articulate uh, every, kind of almost every week, every couple of weeks, she puts out a plan, she puts out her vision on a particular issue. And uh, this is called a plan for economic Patriotism. Somebody's asking if they can call in. No, you can't call in. But if you want, you can uh, you can ask a question using the super chat feature on uh, on YouTube. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, this is Elizabeth Warren. Uh, defend and create American jobs: a plan for economic patriotism. And you know, Elizabeth Warren has she just put out a plan on Wall Street and private equity. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, I, th I think this, is, this idea of defending American jobs is a framework for her entire economic policy. And note how she frames this. She frames this as economic patriotism. Now, more than that, economic, Elizabeth Warren, I think, is, is turning out to be, and I don't know if she'll win the Democratic nomination, although she clearly... She clearly, uh, you know, is one of the lead, one of the leaders in the polls, uh, one of the top three candidates right now in the polls, and beating Bernie Sanders. 
Elizabeth Warren is turning out to be a much, much smarter politician than I expected her to be. What Elizabeth Warren has realized is that you're not going to win. You're not going to win as a socialist. You cannot run as a democratic socialist in America and win. So she is not a socialist. At least she says she's not a socialist. Right? How does she do that? She does it by declaring herself, or what, it, what is she? She declares herself a capitalist. Elizabeth Warren, time and time again, has said, I love capitalism. I am going to save capitalism from itself. I want capitalism. Capitalism is amazing. What capitalism provides is stunning. It just needs to be fixed. It's just being allowed to run amok. We just need better rules around it. Right? But capitalism, capitalism is truly a good system because it produces wealth. So Elizabeth Warren has defined herself as a capitalist. Now what, what she's doing with capitalism is what the right has done with capitalism forever. She's using the term capitalism. She's using the generally positive American view of capitalism and presenting a statist, populist, but patriotic economic vision. So you can't, you can't really, in terms of the rhetoric, we'll talk about the plans are probably different, but in terms of the rhetoric, she has adopted Donald Trump's rhetoric. She has adopted, it's as if uh, Stephen Bannon is her consultant. She has adopted Stephen Bannon's principles. She's adopted Stephen Bannon's ideas, framing everything in terms of what will make America great again, or what will make Capitalism, great again. I mean, that could be your campaign slogan. Her campaign slogan could be making capitalism great again. Right? And it, it's now a surprise, therefore, that somebody like Tucker Carlson cannot differentiate between Elizabeth Warren and Donald Trump, and I don't know if you saw the episode of Tucker Carlson, endorsing Elizabeth Warren's plans, endorsing Elizabeth Warren's program, and indeed reading much of what I just read to you, he read on a show favorably. He said, yes, this is what we need. What we're seeing in America today is an abandonment of principle an abandonment of ideology in the name of economic populism, in the name of economic nationalism, economic patriotism. What we're seeing is, you know, in the name of power, in the name of a massive power grab by Washington, D.C., in the name of pragmatism, the right is no longer ideological, the left is no longer ideological. What they are now is just out for power, do whatever it takes to get the power. It's naked now. They will use whatever language to, you know, motivate the troops, to get people aligned, all in the name of saving the middle class. That's, that's Elizabeth Warren, she keeps repeating. The, 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 you know, what we need is the middle class. She riles against trade. So those of you who think the Democrats are globalists, I mean, all you have to do is read, read, uh, read Elizabeth Warren here. She, she talks about the, lo the massive loss of jobs because of bad trade deals, basically mimicking Donald Trump, but from the left. She talks about the fact that government has worked for the elites, the fact that government has worked for Wall Street, the fact that government has, has made some people rich at the expense of whom? At the expense of working class Americans. Putting American workers and middle class prosperity ahead of multinational profits and Wall Street bonuses. 
That's Elizabeth Warren. That could be Donald Trump. That could be Steve Bannon. So what we're seeing today is the unification of left and right. What we're seeing today is the unification of left and right around economic policy. There is no debate anymore. There is no argument anymore about what economic policy should be in the United States. There is no opposition to the statist economic policies advocated for years and years and years by the left anymore. The only debate between left and right in America today is over social issues. It's over abortion, it's over race, it's over gender, it's over issues like that. But over economic issues, basically, whoever stood for free markets, whoever stood for individual liberty in the realm of economics has completely and utterly buckled and lost. There is no political party today. There are no spokesmen for the idea of economic liberty on either side of the political, of the political map. Right? And that is, you know, unbelievably tragic. And it's exactly what Ayn Rand predicted. It's exactly what Ayn Rand predicted 50 years ago, 60 years ago. That the conservatives could not defend capitalism. The conservatives could not defend free markets. And as a consequence, there would be no voice for free markets in mainstream American politics. And that's exactly, exactly what we're seeing. So what is Elizabeth Warren advocating for? Well, she's advocating for redoing all the tax agreements. She's advocating for penalizing companies that move overseas. She's advocating for getting government to create a basically what she calls a Department of Economic Development that would create, she says, you know, a, a program to bring jobs back to America. The new department will have a single goal, she says, creating and defending good American jobs. Again, what's the difference between her and Donald Trump? None. One of her proposals, one of her proposals, again, completely mirrors what Donald Trump has said. She argues for more actively managing our currency value to promote exports and domestic manufacturing. In other words, let's lower the value of the dollar so it's cheaper for foreigners to buy American goods and more expensive for Americans to buy foreign goods and therefore reduce the trade deficit by manipulating the currency. And at the same time, by the way, let's accuse the Chinese of currency manipulation. So she wants to become a currency manipulator. Again, Donald Trump has said exactly the same thing. She wants to leverage federal research and development to create domestic jobs and sustain investments in the future. She wants basically for the American taxpayer to own, to get stock uh, in exchange for R&D that private companies use that was, you know, funded by taxpayer dollars. She wants, as Mauricio says, she wants fascism, but so does the right. They all want fascism. She said taxpayers should be able to capture the upside of their research investment. Taxpayers didn't make these investments. Bureaucrats make the investment. Maybe, how do we, how do we count for all the lost investments the taxpayers made? How do we count for all the money that the government wastes on basic research that is useless and futile and never gets use for anything. I mean, that's just one. So she says, taxpayers get an equity stake in any company that relies on intellectual property. These investments create, they retain royalties 
on publicly funded innovations or golden share of the patent revenue or require the companies benefiting from publicly funded R&D to reinvest profits back into domestic production and so on and so forth. Now again, I don't think this is something anybody on the right would object to. There is no voice, for example, no voice on the American political landscape today arguing for the elimination a publicly funded research and development, a publicly funded science. There's no voice in the American landscape today, right or left, arguing for the privatization of basic research. So the progressive agenda today in economics is the Trump agenda today in economics. The progressive agenda today in economics is the conservative nationalist agenda in economics. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, by the way, all R&D investment, according to, to, to Juan, should be spread across every region of the country. This is the populism. Not focused on a only a few coastal cities. God forbid we invest too much money in Boston or in Silicon Valley. It, you know, we need research and development dollars in Ohio and in Indiana in Arkansas, in Mississippi, in Alabama. Because we know there's all this scientific talent over there that is just, if only we gave them the money. If only we gave them the money. All right. And she says, look, we need to start investing in our companies. We need to promote export. And, you know, China spends a fortune promoting its export companies. We only spend about $200 million through the Export-Import Bank. You remember the Export-Import Bank, that, that bank that is run by the government that benefits a few American corporations that Republicans over and over again said they would eliminate? They almost eliminated it in one of the budgets. It was, um, it was basically reduced to uh, uh, it, its budget was taken away from it. And um, then the Republicans caved and brought it back, right back, right back. So Elizabeth Warren wants us to dramatically, dramatically uh, increase, you know, what the import-export banks, and, and do 100 times more, billions of dollars, because that's what the Chinese do. So we should mimic China. We should have a managed economy Supposedly managed economy like China. I, I wonder if she also advocates reducing regulations to Chinese levels. We should deploy the massive purchasing power of the federal government to create markets for American-made products. So the government should buy made in America only. But I guess maybe it should buy more than it needs because ultimately it's got all this money lying around and it can print money. The government can print money. And deficits don't matter. There's agreement, by the way, on the left and the right that deficits don't matter. Uh, uh, modern monetary theory says deficits don't matter. You can just print yourself as much money as you want. Rush Limbaugh, over the last few days, said, oh, all that stuff about deficit hawks, that was just us playing politics during the Obama administration. We don't believe in that stuff anymore. Deficits don't matter. So left and right, giving up on deficits. Deficits don't matter. And on and on, you know, we need, in, in, we need apprenticeship programs. We need to spend $20 billion annually on apprenticeship programs. And, of course, we need, again, to mimic our international competitors. They promote their domestic industries. We don't. We don't. We need to stop this unfairness, this globalist unfairness. Now, she proposes, you know, these other countries, one of the things she really, really, really envies these other countries, you know, they all have these great five-year plans. Five-year plans they have. And it's great because they have policy and they have vision and they think long-term and they develop these five-year plans and to protect their own industries. And this is amazing. I mean, Japan has it and Germany has it and, and, and uh, China has it. What we need, she says, we need a four-year plan. I don't know why a four-year plan. 
I don't know why a five-year plan. Maybe, maybe she realizes that five-year plans are still associated with the Soviet Union, and we still think badly about five-year plans. She wants a four-year plan. It's focused on a national job strategy, just like they have in Germany and China. Because Germany and China are so much richer than we are. They produce so much more than we do. Where does this come from? Anyway, that is Warren's plan for economic patriotism. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes.